Welcome to the New York Institute for the Humanities podcast. I'm Robert Boynton. In an earlier episode, I spoke with Adam Schatz and Richard Sears about their podcast, Myself with Others. For the next few weeks, we'll run episodes from it. Last week, we ran Adam's conversation with the critic Margot Jefferson, who is a fellow at the Institute. This week, we're running the first part of a discussion with George Lewis, a composer, writer, and professor at Columbia University. You can find Myself with Others on your regular podcast feeds or at the program's website, myselfwithothers.com. Working with technology has enabled me to rethink what improvisation is and it's theorizing it in a new way. So Afrofuturism, for me, becomes a way of recasting humanism and using technology to think about humanism. And even after years of making computer music, for many years, the most frequently asked question I would get, quite apart from how the thing worked, was, did you do it yourself? Because the assumption was that there's had to be some white guy in the back pulling the strings. Lester Bowie said, we have a world audience, we have to go meet him. You're listening to Myself with Others, a podcast about the life of ideas on and off the page. I'm Adam Schatz, and my guest on this episode is the composer and writer George Lewis, a professor of musicology at Columbia University. George is a friend and also something of a mentor. He's a leading figure of the Association for the Advancement of Creative Musicians in Chicago, the AACM, and the author of its history, A Power Stronger Than Itself, which is also one of the most important studies of music, culture, and creativity in post-war America. George is the recipient of many awards, including the MacArthur Genius Fellowship. He's not just a musical artist, he's also an erudite and penetrating theorist, steeped in continental philosophy and the writings of negritude and creolite. The world he's created in sound and on the page is an invitation to think big, to think openly, and above all, to think generously about our culture and society. This episode has been sponsored by Farrar, Strauss, and Giroux, publisher of Unfinished Business by Vivian Gornick. Unfinished Business, Notes of a Chronic Rereader is Vivian Gornick's celebration of passionate reading, of returning again and again to the books that have shaped her at crucial points in her life. Michael Durda from the Washington Post calls this collection of essays vivacious and highly recommended. Unfinished Business is available where books are sold. Thanks for joining me, George. Thanks, Adam. Thanks very much. George, I want to start by citing two remarks that I think are pretty dear to you from figures who've played an important part in your intellectual and creative life. The first is from Muhal Richard Abrams, the pianist and composer who founded the AACM, the Chicago-based Black Music Collective that you joined in 1971 at the age of 19. Muhal Richard Abrams said, we know that there are different types of black life and therefore we know that there are different types of black music because black music comes forth from black life. Uh, the second quotation is from the philosopher Arnold Davidson with whom you've taught a course at the University of Chicago. Davidson says, the multiplication of perspectives means multiplication of possibilities. Now, George, it seems to me that these two quotes crystallize your thinking in a way, the emphasis on the richness and variety of music made by Afro-diasporic artists, the belief that music grows out of life experience and history rather than being some autonomous domain, and a commitment to creative multiplicity and what you often call creolization not simply because it's a matter of equity and justice, but because it expands our horizons, opens new vistas of expression. Would I be right in saying that? Well, sure. But, you know, those two quotes, you don't need to limit them to music. Uh, but you can learn. I mean, they both were done in the context of thinking about music, but it, it becomes clear that for the first, uh, I quoted that in response to the idea that not only black lives, but black liveness matters. And so if black lives matter, then there are many different kinds of black lives. So, and that gets to what 
Arnold said about the multiplication of possibilities. You know, I've been talking a lot over here, and particularly I'm in Berlin right now for another month, and I've been here for most of the year. I've been engaged a little bit in a kind of a semi-public way on radio and in the press and so on and in colloquia about these ideas of creolization that, that you mentioned. I've been thinking about the possibility that this very small domain that I've been involved with, that is, for lack of a better word, new music or, you know, contemporary music, psychonistry music, neue music, whatever they're calling it here, could really stop thinking of itself as kind of a pan-European diaspora and open up to a kind of a multiplicity of possibilities historically and in the present and in the future. So that that calls for a revision of identity along the lines of creolization. And when I was introduced to these ideas by young uh, ethnologue, uh, Alexander Pierrepont, um, who lives in Paris. Who also writes for the AACM. He wrote a wonderful book, La Nuée, on the AACM. And he just finished a new book. I can't think of the title right now, but we could talk about it later. Um, but he's written extensively on the newer AACM. And um, the one that I wrote about started in 1965 and even before, and I took it up to like 2005, and then I had to stop writing. Anyway, let me um, say that in thinking about contemporary music as a creolized tradition, I'm thinking about it in terms of something like the blues, which is also a creolized tradition, you know? At this point, some people may disagree with me, but you know, What's past is prologue. The blues came from one community and it opened up to the entire world. So wherever you go, someone is doing it. And that's kind of the same with classical music. It started in one place, it moved around the world, but it seems to carry with it, unlike the blues, it seems to carry with it this idea that everyone in the end of the day should refer back to the the origin point as a kind of metropole, as a point of worship for everyone. And that's what I'm kind of challenging. It's odd that there's this kind of primordialist thinking about the blues and about black music generally and this, this emphasis on the origin, the, the root, rather than uh, the directions that the music ends up taking, the R-O-U-T-E, as it were. Well, I can understand that because no one, you know, so much has been stolen from Afro-diasporic people. So when you think about the blues as something that's so powerful and so creative and so many people have invested their lives in it, but a lot of these people really don't want to recognize the origin point and that becomes a kind of theft. And in, on the other hand, what you've got in classical music is a sense that they don't want to recognize the people who are doing it now who are not white because that ends up being kind of exclusion. There was an article in Die Zeit here just the other day about uh, was it racism in classical music? And at one point, someone said, well, can't you just, you leftists, can't you just leave classical music to us, the Europeans? <laughs> and right away, this, there are 500 comments on this article. And I downloaded them all because I wanted to maybe write about this in the future. It took me about two hours to download all those comments. But I wanted to write about this at some point in the future, so I needed the comments. Now, these arguments in the last few years have become incredibly contentious, and, and I'm sure that we'll have a chance to turn to them later. Yeah. But, you know, when I think about your work, the idea of multiplicity comes to mind immediately because of its range. Uh, you were saying rather self-deprecatingly that you occupied this little world of experimental or new music, but you're a composer of acoustic and electronic music, you're a multimedia artist, and you were once, and still are, a great trombonist. You've also written a history of the AACM, you've curated exhibitions, you've written on visual art. Do you think of yourself primarily as a composer, as an artist, as an intellectual? Probably all those things you know, and probably some other things besides. You know, I've tried to sort of, I've tried a lot of things. They haven't all been completely successful. So nowadays I just say composer, musicologist, sometime trombonist, and computer technology, technological artist. And if I do all those things, somewhere I can, I can account for most of what I do in there, you know, the writing and the artistic work. So, yeah. 
To take a recent example, you've just released an album called The Recombinant Trilogy, a sequence of three works for solo instruments accompanied by electronics. Now, these pieces do allude uh, in some oblique fashion to black music history, but the relationship is not always immediately evident to the ears. Hmm. These are works of contemporary classical composition. We're going to listen to an excerpt from one of those pieces, an extraordinary work for cello and electronics called Not Alone, performed here by the cellist Seth Parker Woods. What a stunning piece, George. Uh, it's dedicated to the cellist Abdul Wadud, who was a member of the St. Louis Black Artists Group, uh, a collective inspired by the AACM. Abdul Wadud was also a brilliant collaborator of the Reed Man and composer uh, Julius Hemphill. I suspect that the title, Not Alone, is a wink at Abdul Wadud's 1977 solo album, By Myself since Seth Parker Woods here, uh, is not quite alone. He's surrounded by electronics. No, totally. And that's the idea. I mean, I was lucky enough to perform with Abdul Wadud, who was a fantastic musician, and that uh, that one solo record, and then the amazing work he did on the Julius Hemphill piece, that piece that was in 13, what was it called? Um, Dogon A.D., Extraordinary work, extraordinary, amazing stuff, you know, and he just totally recomposed the cello in his own way. And so, and it was not very well known that he had done this. And uh, and Seth, Seth used this piece, we used it as a way of recovering Abdul to find him. And eventually we, we did find him. He had been off the air for a while. Uh, Tomika Reed, another great cellist, uh, got in touch with him. And so the idea behind that piece was to have multiple cellos and multiple spaces and dialogue and to really make a giant ensemble of cellos out of the one cello using electronics. And, um, and it's, it's the second in a, in a whole series of these pieces. The Recombinant Trilogy is three of these pieces. There have been several since then. But Seth has played this piece so much. I mean, he has just made it totally his own. It's extraordinary. Had Seth heard about Abdul Wadud before you introduced him to this composition? Yes, yes. No, I didn't tell him about Abdul. He found that out on his own. He knows everything about the cello, you know. What I find fascinating in this piece, and I think it's typical of your work, George, is that it has one foot in the sonic future, in all these swirling cellos and electronics, and another foot in the past. Uh, and it seems to me that all of your work has this very rich sense of historicity. No matter how, quote unquote, futuristic you are, you're always, or very often at least, paying homage to some aspect of the music of your musical ancestors. You know, it's funny. Um, I could do that in some pieces and in others I just don't. Uh, because, you, you know, there was a thing that was happening in an earlier generation of, of black classical composers. And, and, you know, you could trace it, William Grant Still, um, when William Grant Still broke away from 
Well, J.C. graduated in a way. He didn't break away. But I mean, he studied with Edgar Varese, but then he decided he wanted to follow his own path. And it wasn't like the ultramodernism of those people. You know, when he composed the Afro-American First Symphony, this idea of a blues and sonata form, you know, ideals of hybridity, a political agenda that was, you know, masterfully, brilliantly embedded into the music. So I think that was a touchstone for future generations. I mean, Florence Price, the Juba movement, some, you know, uh, and then later, Ollie Wilson, Hale Smith, uh, Dorothy Rudd Moore, all these people. It's also used to brilliant effect in Charles Burnett's film, Killer of Sheep. Oh, I didn't know that. Wow. I have to see the film. Yeah, I'd see that. But, you know, I was going to say that um, that was a strategy I understand because of and Julius Eastman does it. It does this in his own very um, transgressive way, a little more upfront and pointed than this generation, which was to place uh, Afro-diasporic, African-American concerns on the particular on the classical music table and insist that these histories were a part of that music. And that's, a, you know, with varying degrees of success, what I found was that um, that a lot of these people, you know, Tanya Leone, another person of that uh, generation, extremely well known in the U.S., but hardly known at all over here in Europe, where I am now. So, and so the idea that Afro-diasporic histories were a part of classical music, that was something that in the last couple, last year or so, been able to put that on the table a little bit. But the old, the idea was always seemed to be that you had to, um, you're, they were also trying to appeal to be a part of the black community. In other words, turn this and say, well, this is a part of what we do also, you know, and to make that work as well. It's interesting to me, George, that your students, uh, Courtney Bryan and Taishan Sori, both gifted composers, have been very explicit about their influences. Taishan has dedicated many of his works to composers who've influenced him, uh, including you. And Courtney Bryan has been very outspoken about the impact of Alice Coltrane's work on her compositions. I like the one Tyshawn wrote for me. I also like the one he wrote for Fred Lairdahl. He seems to like be able to bring out some essence. I mean, those are, I mean, Fred was his major teacher at Columbia. I worked with him for a while, but Fred was his major teacher. And so really that influence. But I was I was going to try to tease out that strategy again of trying to, I call it the keeping it real strategy before the hip hop people came along. You know, the idea that somehow you had to sort of refer to blackness in some elemental way and every piece had to present some image of blackness. And I decided I didn't have to do that. I mean, I did that in 96 with um, uh, a piece that a lot of people played, North Star Boogaloo, where we took the voice of Quincy Troop and sort of made it into, he reads the poem virtually, you know, the computer program reads samples of his work. And then there's a percussionist, Stephen Schick, who's playing a totally notated score. And there are all these sort of hip hop beats and samples and so on. And that was sort of the last piece where I thought I needed to do that. It was something where I didn't want to get stuck there as a kind of strategy. I wanted to be able to explore whatever histories I wanted to explore. And, you know, uh, that was an easier, uh, it was easier for me because as you said, I do, I look around a lot, I'm pretty curious. I've been in touch with a lot of communities and discourses and, you know, you, you don't want to feel that there's some, you don't want to feel that there's some, some leash that you're on, you know. Right, and also your impulses are as personal uh, as they are collective. In a way, I think what you're talking about is James Baldwin's notion of the burden of representation. Uh, you're not and could not possibly be expressing the entirety of the black experience in every piece that you write. Nobody can do that, you know. And, you know, and in other words, what happens is you're not expressing the black experience, you're creating it. You're creating it for people. You're sort of renewing it. You're taking it into new areas. You're trying to see, oh, this this is, um, you know, I mean, what was that? Somebody a long time ago, there was this mighty chalk dust, you know, the Calypso artist. And he has a whole song, which I've never been able to find on the web. It's called, it says, a black man invented that. <laughs> He talks about a black man invented that do out of writing black man invented that <laughs> so you know people look at these things they say oh a black man invented that 
<laughs> or, or a black woman or, or a black trans person or whatever. So, and then that just extends what it means to be black into a kind of an infinite space where you can't be limited or tied down. And this actually gets to the idea that you have connected to Taishan's work, which is that of mobility, right? And uh, by which you mean aesthetic mobility. Well, it's an old hobby horse of mine, mobility. You know, I wrote about it in the ACM book. I, that's sort of the idea is to make sure we're not stuck in one place. Mo I think it was um, Farrah Jasmine Griffin's first book uh, about who set you flown, about the black migration, about the great migration, where she talks about mobility as a source of strength and power. And you sort of see that. I mean, all these black Americans stuck in the South. They tried, when people wanted to leave, they tried to keep them from leaving. They they threatened people, they hijacked trains. They did all kinds of stuff to keep people from, from expressing that mobility because at least they had agency. Suddenly they had the power. They didn't realize it before. And changing societal conditions meant that they could, people could move. And my parents were a part of that too. And also, if anyone's going to know about mobility and movement, it's, it's going to be musicians who, you know, go back to the troubadours, right? Sure, you got to move around. As Lester Bowie said, we have a world audience, we have to go meet them. You were born in 1952 on the south side of Chicago. Your parents, as you just mentioned, uh, had made the great migration from the south. Your dad was a Navy veteran, he worked in the post office, loved jazz that was popular among African Americans of his generation, people like Brother Jack McDuff, Tab Smith, Cleanhead Vinson. And he also had a passion for electronics, which I find fascinating given your own history of experimentation with electronic music. Is that how you developed your interest in electronic sound? Was it through your dad? Probably. I mean, you know, I was kind of an early reader. And so he, you know, he, he never got a chance to work in the industry. He worked in the post office, but he had all this training from the GI Bill. And of course, the GI Bill treated black people differently from everybody else. But still, he did manage to get some training in electronics, but he never managed to get an actual job. So he, um, you know, he was the, he was known in our family as the TV fixer. If your TV was broke, he would bring his tube tester and he would fix it and I'd go along with him or whatever. And he would show me certain things about how they worked or he would start talking about Ohm's law or something, or he'd say, well, here's a circuit diagram. This is a capacitor. This is a resistor. I'm like five years old. What, what do I know about these things? Then like, um, you know, years later, you know, I'm 25 or 26 and I'm looking at a circuit diagram and thinking, oh, I know what this is. You've seen this before. How do I know this? You know, I can build this. You know, I hadn't had any experience, but it didn't matter because somehow those lectures from the early childhood had kind of sunk in in some way. Yeah. So, I, I would I don't I don't think he liked electronic music that much, <laughs> but he certainly he certainly had a love and ardent love for electronics. You went to the Chicago Lab School. Yeah, got some pretty great teachers at the Lab School. One of them just passed away, Frank Tiro. He was well, the first teacher. You know, me and Ray Anderson uh, were the same class first day, doing the same thing with the trombone, trying to figure out how it worked. Frank Tiro wasn't a trombonist, he was a saxophonist, and he was also a music theorist and musicologist. And then later he became dean of the Yale School of Music. So, but at the time, he might have even been a graduate student when he taught us. This was 1960. And then later, the other great one that taught both of us was Dean Hay at high school. And he was the one who introduced us to improvisation and, you know, trying to create, he created a class on improvisation to learn how to do it. You know, you had to, it was sort of like, I mean, we were in high school, right? So you had to learn all these scales and you had you know, all this practicing you had to do. And then he would bring in, you had to bring in examples of music you were listening to. You know, um, uh, Ray Anderson brought in uh, Ascension. I brought in Lester Young. <laughs> so there you go. And so it was very diverse. And, it, you know, so that was important stuff. and. And the other great teacher was still, and you know, Dean is still alive, and so is Earl Bell, the social studies teacher. And he was just one of these people that taught you how to think, and he's still teaching you how to think. And he's involved with, at this day, he's in his 80s, personal research on uh, black genealogies in North Carolina, where he's from. And of course, my dad is from North Carolina, and so they bonded over that. 
And so it's now generations. I went to see, I went, had dinner with him not too long ago. He also taught Erwin Chemerinsky, who I didn't know. So, uh, you know, all these people he taught, he taught Valerie Jarrett. Barack Obama's <laughs> in, right? Right. <laughs> now, why the trombone? Well, it was just the biggest, it was just the biggest thing in the story. You know, it looked pretty impressive, you know. Were you listening to J.J. Johnson or Curtis Fuller? Nah. No, I wasn't listening to any of that. It was, it was totally like, at a certain point, they said, well, look, maybe people should be playing musical instruments. This is in the third grade. We went to some music fair and, uh, and looked at all the instruments. And, you know, of course, my parents are wondering how they're going to pay for this, you know, because they didn't have any money, you know. But they, my mom paid $5 a month for this trombone. I don't know how they did it, you know. So, yeah, that said, well, let's pick this one. And it was actually quite frustrating. I keep thinking, what if I pick something else? But um, it was a little annoying all the time. And then it, it took years. I was always fighting with it. In fact, it's always been kind of an ambivalence, you know, toward the trombone, you know. When you were 13, the AACM emerged. But my guess is you probably didn't know about it at the time. Didn't know about it, no. Uh, when I was maybe, in, Ray, Ray took me to a concert of Fred Anderson, which was so baffling. Uh, I didn't know what to do with that. The tenor saxophonist. Yeah, and um, who I later played with a lot. And then and then I went on my own to the Art Ensemble of Chicago was playing at Ida Noyes Hall on the University of Chicago campus. This was 1968, just before they left for Paris. So it was just the four of them then. It wasn't Don Moyer, it wasn't it. It was Lester Bowie and Joseph Jarman and Roscoe Mitchell and Malachi Favors, and another, and again, that was quite baffling. And I have written about these things, my first experience with them, and so on. And it's a very funny thing, because I think I'm probably the only person who has written about the ACE, who written about the Art Ensemble, who actually performed with them. And so I wrote some liner notes for Art Ensemble record where that was kind of noted. But it was all very mysterious and difficult to understand, and, and I didn't meet them for a couple of years later, until a couple of years later. But you were aware of Bop and aware to some extent of free jazz, weren't you? Well, you know, I mean, I was aware of people, genres. You're talking about genres. I'm talking about individuals. I, I mean, there's a wonderful uh, musician who lives in Boston, Carolyn Wilkins Ritt, who was then Carolyn Wilkins, and she was a drummer. And now she's also a pianist and composer. And she gave me a copy of, we always had these exchanges in the high school. She gave me a copy of Coltrane's Live at the Village Vanguard again with Farrell Sanders, et cetera. And Alice Coltrane. I liked all that right away. But then I started to realize that it was similar to a record my dad had, Miles Davis, Someday My Prince Will Come. And there are two saxophonists. There's Coltrane and Hank Mobley. And he liked Hank Mobley, and he did like Coltrane, but he mixed them up. So he thought the guy he liked was Coltrane. <laughs> so when I got this other record, I said, well, this guy on this Live at the Village Vanguard thing sounds like the other guy, the one you don't like. It's <laughs> but it's totally different because, I mean, like at the end, you know, it's totally different music, right? So how do you hear that? There's some weird es essence about the way everyone plays. It's sort of um, all the all the development over the years, you know, just sort of, uh, there was a certain essence. You could hear the, I could hear the, the voice, you know, and it's a voice that stuck with me throughout my life, I have to say, uh, John Coltrane. So. Well, you once remarked, I think, that I get up in the morning thinking more about John Coltrane than about John Cage. Well, that's probably true. <laughs> That's probably true. I probably thought more about Coltrane in any event over the years. In 1996, George, you published a path-breaking essay called Improvised Music After 1950, Afrological and Urological Perspectives. And the piece draws this fascinating contrast between the reception of bebop, the improvised music of Charlie Parker, Dizzy Gillespie, Kenny Clark, Thelonious Monk, on the one hand, and on the other, the chance music of John Cage and the New York School, composers like Earl Brown and Christian Wolfe. 
these schools of music had rarely been juxtaposed in the way that you did in this piece, as if they had been separate worlds, when in fact we know that they weren't. We know, for example, that Charlie Parker was fascinated by Edgar Varese's music and wanted to study with him. Then there's the case of Eric Dolphy, who was very interested in contemporary classical music and, and himself performed a piece by Edgar Varese. And you argue, as you put it, the space of whiteness provided a convenient platform for racialized denial of the challenge of Bob, of an Afrological sensibility. The implication is that the memory and celebration of the New York School of chance music of John Cage and Morton Feldman helped to erase the impact of bop beyond jazz. I'm wondering, was this erasure deliberate or was it a kind of unconscious effect of white supremacy? I mean, how did that erasure occur? It's a brilliant and thought-provoking piece, but I'm not really sure about the causality. Let me sort of start in a different vein about this overlong essay, which I'm glad you like, which has been foisted on generations of students, apparently, since it came out in 1996. I still see people reading it. I can't believe it hardly, you know. But, um, and these terms, Afrological and Urological, people seem to be taking those up as well for some odd reason, but- I think, by the way, that they're using those terms in a way that you didn't intend. Well, many people do because they forgot the part about how they're not designed to be ethically essential. Uh, but anyway, let me let me sort of think about what you're saying. Um, the article is really about a strategy of deauthorization. That is to say that um, we we were encouraged to believe that white composers such as John Cage, who I never met, but who Cage passed through Chicago and played with Jarman. Well, that's true. And and he was a mentor to a lot of other people that, who I worked with, like Richard Teitelbaum or David Behrman, who were mentors of mine, as well as Muhal. Um, but the idea that he was a, had a special authority about Black music, where he could make these, and others could make these pronouncements about the aesthetics or the structure or the utility or the or matters of excellence, uh, you know, there was... Cage was very dismissive of jazz. Well, whether he was dismissive or not, you know, the idea was he was an authority. So the idea is why, what made him an authority? And so that's where whiteness comes in. And so I'm noticing as a new generation of people like Philip Yule take up the critique of whiteness, <laughs> you know, I'm thinking, well, this is great. And come, great, great to see that being talked about again. And, um, but whiteness in its defining role, as I call it somewhere in the article. So the idea was to break up the idea of whiteness in its defining role and to let, let other people have a defining role as well. The question of whether one was influenced by the other, you know, I, I mean, of course they were. There was a mutual influence there. Going back to um, Bacchanal, the first prepared piano piece, which he wrote for the dancer Seville Fort, I think it was at Cornish in Seattle in 1940. And the idea was that he asked, Seville Fort asked Cage to create something with an African sound. Well, I mean, what you hear in Bacchanal is actually a Balinese sound. So I guess that's close enough. <laughs> You know, these, these currents were in the air. I mean, Henry Cowell, Cage's teacher, certainly knew a lot about African-American musical forms. I mean, these things were not, as you say, they people were in contact, but at a certain point, a racializing regime wanted to separate them. And so that's the causality. It causes, it causes ignorance, and it also causes a sense of, it was an identity strategy. Another thing that I maybe didn't say, because there's an afterword to this essay as well, which I'm not sure I'm talking about. This has been a long time since I reviewed this. But one of the issues with, um, I think, this generation of composers, the New York School, was that when they came along, 
bebop, which had been something that the abstract expressionists took up, the abstract expressionists were kind of their forebears and more in their wheelhouse. You know, and a lot of these people, they knew jazz very well. And so I felt that there was a lot of pressure on that generation to really break away from jazz as a way of distinguishing themselves, which I think is a making space for themselves, a kind of strategic essentialism, as I think it was either Gayatri Spivak put it. So that was a strategy that I understood. I once had a chat with Alvin Lucier about it years later, um, you know, as a means of making space for yourself. And that's very important. And uh, because they really weren't trying to make bebop and they weren't imitating bebop or any of that. Earl Brown was a jazz trumpet player. And there's more to this, but this is just an overview. I don't want to go into it too long, but, uh, you know. No, of course. Um, but it occurs to me, just to go back to Coltrane for a moment, uh, that you could apply the argument that you made about bebop and the New York school to a later school of the American avant-garde, um, namely minimalism. Lamont Young, Terry Riley, Steve Reich, Philip Glass. Hmm. Uh, Riley and Reich made no secret of their passion for John Coltrane, especially the use of repetition and drone hmm. in works like My Favorite Things and Africa Brass. But as with Cage, in their early works, at least in the early work of Reich and Glass, uh, because I think the, the later work is more expressive, they're aiming at a kind of structural impersonality. They want to reveal the process of their work mm -hmm. in a way very much in line with artists like Saul LeWitt and Richard Serra, who were their friends in New York City, which to me is a very interesting contrast with figures like Coltrane and artists working in an African-American musical tradition where there's more of an emphasis on the voice, on expressivity. Well, I, if you look at slavery as a, in the U.S. as a form of silencing, when slavery is over, suddenly you get a lot of music that emphasizes voice. And so that kind of continues right to the era that you're mentioning. Intention, right, because Cage's work, and it's about surrender to, to chance and to, uh, to process. Well, I didn't see anything wrong with intention. I didn't see the, the, I didn't see that as any kind of moral imperative as it had been portrayed in the new music milieu that somehow there was something wrong with a will or intention or psychology and all these kinds of things and you know that kind of scientism wasn't required you know it was just another way of looking at life and, and so but the idea there was something inferior about looking at something well that couldn't be sustained and so that was. I guess that was another part of what the 1996 Afrological, Eurological essay was about. I mean, I'd say about the Coltrane influence, I mean, Terry and Lamont were both uh, soprano saxophonists. And so there's actually, I'd say that both of them to varying degrees took up the mantle of establishing voices. There is one famous process piece in C, okay, but I think most of Terry's work didn't really do that. Lamont's work seemed more about establishing a con set of conditions and working out of that. Now, Steve, uh, Philip, you know, sort of that, and people that came afterwards, more like process music, but it, it, as, we, as we know it now, you know, I think we have to look at something, what binds these people to, together. And one of the things that binds them is a kind of looking outward from Western tradition. And for a lot of African-American musicians, Art Blakey and others, you know, I mean, Coltrane, this is a kind of proto-post-colonialist look at what music could be. I think that really is something that brings together a lot of the, the different disparate experimental music traditions. In the, you know, in the U.S., American experimentalism. Right, this fascination with music outside the West, whether it's Balinese music or African music or Carnatic music, as in the case of Coltrane. Yeah, yeah, precisely. I wondered whether the roots of that article or the thinking it expressed lay partly in frustrations you might have had at Yale, uh, where you first started studied music. You were originally in the music department, but you eventually switched to philosophy. Was there a kind of hidebound thinking in the music department? 
No, I think probably most of the problems I had, they were my own fault, you know. I mean, like, the thing is, you go there, most of the people who went to a school like Yale had much better training than I did coming in um, because they had more money, <laughs> for one thing. <laughs> I mean, I, you know, I went to the lab school, but I'm not from the black middle class or any middle class. So in the end, I thought it was good for me to switch because I felt that I wasn't doing what I needed to do. But the moment I switched, I ran into these extraordinary teachers. I remember for, well, I had a number of teachers that I remember from there. Yale was an amazing experience, but Robert Ferris Thompson, he taught the uh, African art classes, you know, he was incredible. Um, uh, I had a Lazarus Akwame for a year in music theory. That was wonderful. I don't think he surely doesn't remember me at all. I wasn't actually that good in his class. Then they, <laughs> then um, let's see. And then these two wonderful philosophy people, David Carr and Edward Casey, who are big music heads and who still come to my concerts, unbelievably, you know? And uh, they were phenomenologists, and uh, they set me on a path where I, which I'm still on today in some ways. You know, where I, that's a, that's an area of philosophy that has come to be very important in terms of music. And the music theorist uh, Thomas Clifton, the late music theorist, well, he's been gone for quite a long time, co-taught a class with David Carr that I participated in about phenomenology of music, and a lot of those insights ended up in. And Clifton's book, Music Has Heard, which was kind of jump-started a lot of the interest in film, not of music and music theory. Were you partly drawing upon Merleau-Ponty's work in the phenomenology of perception? Well, yeah, sure. But I think more, even more Husserl than Merleau-Ponty in this case, I think. And so I wrote about, you know, you have to write a senior thesis. So I wrote about, uh, tried to write about um, Wadada, for example. <laughs> If I'm not mistaken, would Dada Leo Smith was living in New Haven at the time. There was this little music community with Wadada, Marion Brown. Um, Theron Akloff, Jerry Hemingway. Anthony Davis. Was this when you met Wadada? Yeah, Wadada, um, he came to my dorm room one day. He said he had heard there was a, someone from the AACM in, in Yale. He couldn't believe that. So, <laughs> so he came. And he came with a, a lot of scores and a bunch of stuff. And it, he would come out, he would come a lot. He was an early riser. I really wasn't, but uh, <laughs> not like then, no, but they were, he, they had his own musical system. You know, he had, it was called the Acreavention system then. And later it became what he's better known for the Ankh Ross Mation system. And he wrote a piece actually for me using the Acreavention system, which was, and I've been trying to find the original score of that. It's on some hard drive somewhere. I scanned it. I don't know if I have the original. But he and he wrote a wonderful book called Rhythm, which has a lot of these ideas from that period in it. And, but anyway, he would come all the time. And uh, Bobby and Anthony and Ferron, you know, we all. I mean, they. Anthony was playing more in the community of New Haven. You know, and um, especially after I graduated in 74. Anthony Davis was also a student at Yale, wasn't he? Oh, yeah, we came in the same year, but he graduated a year after me, yeah. No, he and his wife, who worked with uh, Debbie Atherton, who um, worked on the second opera, librettist with him, who they married, got married, you know. Yeah, we all came in the same year in 69, fall of 69. Yeah, he came to my graduation, Leo. <laughs> <laughs> you know, his kids, I remember the kids when they were small and everything. Now they're all grown up with their own kids. It's amazing. You know? We were talking a moment ago about the growing attention that whiteness has received in classical music and classical music studies. Uh, you mentioned the, the argument that broke out after uh, the publication of Philip Ewell's essay. And you and I talked about that essay when I profiled Taishan Sori in the Times Magazine. Yeah. My sense, though, is that for all the attention that uh, whiteness has received in the new scholarship and, of course, on social media, much of that has ignored the cautionary note in your essay where you say that the idea of Afrological and urological systems 
uh, refers to social and cultural location mm. and is theorized, in your words, as historically emergent rather than ethnically essential. My sense is that there's been a regression or at least a drift back towards essentialism or what Gayatri Spivak calls strategic essentialism. Still, it's noticeable. And I'm thinking, for example, of the accusations that have been made hmm. against Steve Reich over his classical civil rights piece, Come Out, in which he uses a recording of the voice of Daniel Hamm, a victim of police brutality during the Harlem Revolt of 1964. I'm thinking also of the attack on your friend and colleague, George Friedrich Haas, over the composition that he wrote in memory of Eric Garner, uh, entitled I Can't Breathe. Both Reich and Haas are white composers, uh, white male composers, who have been criticized for using material, musical material, political material, an experience that is said to not belong to them, to not be in their lane. I know that you're an admirer of Reich's work and that you've defended uh, George Friedrich Haas's composition in memory of Eric Garner. So I wanted to ask you, how do we adjudicate these questions of cultural appropriation? How do we judge when love slides into theft? How do we judge the work of magpie artists like Stravinsky or Bob Dylan or Miles Davis or John Zorn? All artists in their own way of appropriation. Have we gone too far to the other side? Are we dealing with a kind of zealous overcorrection? Yeah. You know, for me, uh, Georg's piece was just a simple response to inhumanity, an attempt to assert the humanity and, and to be able to do that through so-called classical music and out of the field of classical music. And it's not the only thing that Georg has brought classical music to account with, for example, uh, extended sexualities. Uh, Georg has managed to put that on the table as something that classical music as a field needs to think about. And it's an, as it's an aspect of its identity where there's a lot of talk about how music shouldn't be political, whatever that means. And the, so this seems kind of naive at this point to think that music isn't political or, or can't be. Art. But the appropriation problem, you know, for a while it kind of, in the 90s, it was really intense and you had, what is it, the deep forest controversy and so on. And a lot of it has always been about power. You know, no one seemed to mind when John Coltrane, maybe some people did, I don't know. I mean, for example, many people thought that John Coltrane composed Afro Blue, was Mongo Santa Maria. So, or, or it, Coltrane's interest in Bismillah Khan, for example, and in Indian, in modes of Indian classical music, naming his son Ravi and these kinds of things. And, and drawing from those musics. Which his widow did to brilliant effect as well. Well, people, people were trying to actually deny that she had even had a right to do that, that somehow the idea of being an African-American Hindu, you, you couldn't do that or something like that. <laughs> you know. And these are not just the music, but embracing an, an entire culture and embracing something larger than just oneself and the community from which one came. Because if you listen to the old, that old tape that's floating around the internet of her playing with Terry Gibbs and you compare that, it's not even the same person. Or maybe it is, maybe there's a voice there. But I experience it from the other side, which is, you know, I think of myself as being someone who has learned and basically appropriated from all kinds of people and, and forms and musics. And, but no one ever thinks of me as being an appropriationist because, uh, because I'm supposed to be in a position of, as a designated subaltern. And so, so that's like being a designated hitter in baseball or something. But when Georg Haas does that, that's supposed to be a problem because he's a designated non-subaltern. But in the face of neoliberal ideologies, uh, we've all been designated as subalterns. Uh, so, yeah, at a certain point, the market is what, um, what Eric Garner died from. 
uh, selling cigarettes on the street one at uh, one at a time. So something that's not allowed um, under under you know the enforcement of the police of these neoliberal regimes. So I the reason why I didn't see that work as being appropriation is because he wasn't stealing anything. It was this is Georg Haas's music. All he did was he referred to a social situation and he he decided that as a human being he should be able to comment. Would you say that of Steve Reich with his use of African-American voices in Come Out and It's Going to Rain? Well, that's a different matter, I think. A lot of times, I remember, maybe Henry Threadgill told me this, I'm not sure. He said, you can take from anyone, but you shouldn't be heard doing it. <laughs> you know. Uh, so I think that in the case of Come Out, it was interesting, like that malapropism, or, or was it, or whatever you call it, when the guy says he meant to say bruised blood, but he ended up saying blues blood. And maybe Steve picked up on that, but maybe he didn't, but it became a part of the piece. And at the end of the day, I, I mean, like, um, what, who did come out sound like? I mean, it didn't sound like Coltrane. You know, it didn't sound like Indian classical music. It didn't sound like African music. Sounds like Steve Reich. Yeah, it sounded like something, and he and there are other pieces in that vein. It's going to rain and so on, and so. But and, and later though, there's pieces like drumming, where you do start to see a strong kind of influence from Northern Awe music, and um, and to the extent that maybe there's a stronger case for appropriationist stance there, but still, at some point, we're all finding our way, and. Um, you know, it's a great piece, you know, so what do you do with that? But it, but the funny part about it is the really great pieces of Steve's, I think, are in the future. I think when he, he hits his real stride with Taylor, which I think is a real classic for me, it's an important piece. In my life, it's an important piece. Beautiful work. This concludes the first segment of Adam Schatz speaking with George Lewis on Myself with Others. Myself with Others is produced by Richard Sears. Thank you to Eric Banks, Robert Boynton, and the New York Institute of Humanities. Thanks as well to New Focus Records. The music on Myself with Others is composed by Richard Sears. Thank you for listening and please subscribe. <laughs>